Hey now, hey there, it's your pal Drew, and I'm back with yet another episode. I've been kind of prolific this week, because, uh, you know, two weeks I was away, I kind of had a backlog of ideas, and uh, this one, <clears throat> trying not to cough, uh, is dealing with Mobius, he of the poorly reviewed movie, um... Could have been done a lot better from what I understand. I didn't listen to it. I just, I, I didn't watch it. I listened to the reviews and uh, pretty much all of them said it was dreadful. Um, I was never a fan of Morbius uh, because when Marvel would do bad, would, when they were able to start doing supernatural stuff around 1970, um, their villains, their monsters look like superheroes. I mean, he looks more like a superhero than a vampire. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, commit to the bit. It's like Dracula, which lasted 70 issues with the same team, except for the first issue. I mean, it was, it's, it's still revered as a great vampire comic that lasted so long with the same creative team for forever, uh, all through the seventies. And this seems like an ass, it, it just seems like a half-assed way to do it, you know? And then... With Man Wolf, he became Star God, which was kind of cool. But he, I mean, he wasn't. And then they had Werewolf by Night, which also was very superheroic, and uh, it, it, because you had, you know, the new guard of of Marvel writers who just love superheroes, and that was just their way to, you know, they might get nudged to do it, uh, or say, hey, I'll give it a try. But then it ends up being another Marvel comic. Um, what I love is they made two epic collections of this, and it pretty much covers all of his solo stuff up until uh, he was cured. So, for now, I want to start real quick. He was created by uh, Roy Thomas and Gil Kane. While uh, uh, Peter was dealing with two extra, four or more arms, it, I have another episode coming up that deals with that, and. Uh, so I mean, his whole origin is so odd. It's like a, he became a scientifically scientific based vampire, and uh, I just always had a, trouble with that origin. But you know, a lot of people love Morbius, so I ain't gonna bag on him. Uh, but finally, it's his own book after appearing in like giant sized creatures or something like that. And uh, here we go. And what's funny is, by popular demand, the house the pulse-pounding premiere of a startling new series. Now, you want to know why it didn't start with issue one? Back then, they wanted to keep the numbering so retailers, newsstand people, drugstores, would, would, they would be like, oh, this number one is untested and untried. It's like, I don't, you know, if you had a few digits in there, it, it was like, oh, it's, it's going to be around for a while. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of smoke and mirrors smoke and mirrors okay mike friedrich uh and paul galacy uh I, this is right before uh his kick-ass uh pardon the pun uh term on master of kung fu jack abel on the inks which is really interesting you can so see the steranko uh the the line work or the physicality uh, I'm going to take it now. Well, I'm going to jump ahead. Next issue. Adventure into Fear. Another brilliant Gil Kane cover, possibly inked by either Tom Palmer or Klaus Janssen, who was starting to do some amazing stuff. Both of them, well, uh, Klaus Janssen was definitely from the Neil Adams studio. Um, so, third issue. Steve Gerber, Gil Kane, Vinnie Coletta. And, uh, it's just kooky. Let's see. Yeah, give me a second, would you? Would you, would you, would you, would you? Hang in there, everybody. I just want to make sure I got my numbers right on this. Ah. La, la, la. I will sing you a song in the meantime. Won't that be great? Everybody will be happy. Okay, well. Steve Gerber, Gil Kane, Vinnie Coletta. A very odd combo. And, uh... It wasn't that often that Kane was drawing at this time because he was doing all the Marvel covers. He would come in for an hour during Roy Thomas's lunch break, 
Roy would toss out an uh, idea for every cover. Gil Kane would write it all down and then head back home and bang them out. So that's why we've got so many cool... Uh, ah, here we go. <clears throat> Steve Gerber still around. Rich Buckler on the layouts. Pencils by uh, Dominguez. He might have been one of those uh, Filipino artists that I uh, enjoy, but uh, I, I think Vinny may have you know, cut this up a bit. And also, uh, Buckler almost never does breakdowns. I mean, he usually is pretty complete, so it's, it's just a stew of ugliness. Now, now St Steve Gerber and Craig Russell. Hates by Vinnie Coletta. I mean, look how much is going into this already. Uh, Craig Russell, he started off doing some uh, short Ant-Man stories in the back of Marvel Feature. And uh, so now we have Anchor Jack Abel. You know, same two uh, penciler and writers. And um, yeah, and this book ended up being more of a sci-fi image. Boy, that's so Galaxy. Is this a Galaxy issue? Is he back? No? Oh, okay. Well, anyway, great pose. And P. Craig Russell was one of those guys who, you know, learned by leaps and bounds. I'm not going to go over to the black and white stuff because I'm tr that's a whole different thing. They're allowed to do a lot more uh, violence and such. And also, it's not in the con the Marvel continuity, the oh, so important continuity that we grew up loving. Okay, now Doug Mensch is doing the script off of a Steve Gerber plot. Inked by Frank uh, Fra Frank Robbins art and Frank Giacoya on the inks. I don't know if those two ever worked together before, but wow, I just love it. And f I've said a billion times, Frank Robbins is an acquired taste, but he is a dynamic storyteller. I remember growing up thinking, oh, I hate this guy, I hate this guy. But you know what? I kept going back to the invaders because he just did such a magnificent job on it. So deep in my mind, I kind of got over it. You know, I mean, some sure there are some panels that are really wonky, and I think he was, like most everybody else, kind of prompted to have that Kirby power foreshortening and everything. And uh, it wasn't like it wasn't necessarily a good fit. So, hey, everybody, Topeka, are you ready to rock and roll? Ah. Okay, so we have uh, Doug Mensch, uh, Frank Robbins, Frank Giacoya, Inker. Bill Mantlo is the colorist. You will see a lot of later creators start that way and work their way to the top. Um, Dave Hunt did the same thing. Uh, so th that's pretty damn cool. And there's a werewolf by night, which doesn't count because it's not in the normal uh, series. But Nestor Redondo, I guess it's Virgil Redondo, his brother or something. So uh, it was okay. I love this cover, the way it's recolored. Now, second half of Morbius, another Gil Kane. It's kind of, if you, I'm not trying to be a hard ass or like a Mr. Sensitive 2023, but it has to be a drag if you're a female fan and you see pretty much any woman in a comic book at the time back then was usually the hostage that the hero has to carry. <laughs> it's just kind of. You know what? That was the industry standard. I just like saying that word. Um, now, we have us Doug Minch. Uh, never said, learn how to say his name. And uh, Frank Robbins, penciler. And D. Frazier, anchor. I'm like, what is a D. Frazier? I mean, I've got a, you know, I've got a mind like still trap when it comes to comic book creations. But, uh, nope, nope. Never heard of before or after. You know, maybe the person wasn't cut out. To a regular book. Okay, we're back with now we have Doug Bunch, Frank Robbins, and Vinnie Coletta, and Tom Orzakowski, early Tom Orzakowski. He started with the series from the beginning. Now, Bill Mantlo's story, the guy who was just coloring a few months ago, Don Heck Art, and Bob McLeod on the inks. And I love this combination. I just do. When 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 Heck inked himself I loved it on westerns, I loved it on war stories, or even scary stories from Atlas Comics, but in superheroes, when he inked himself, it was a little too, I don't know what, it would fit more like in a war story, I mean, because 
Superheroes are usually glitz, glitz and glamour. Glitz and glamour. Okay. But, you know, I don't know, it just ties it in ties, tighter with the uh, spotting of blacks. Now we go to. Who is this guy? <laughs> Sorry, Bill Bantlow. Art George Evans. Frank Springer. Those two both did a lot of uh, inking and uh, work together. But another change that's just what is that five or six i haven't even counted uh between the writers and the artists it's, it's great cover even though i was kind of bagging on it for a while um F frank robbins and vinnie coletta now here's the weird thing when when robbins was doing uh newspaper strips and when he was doing uh, some of the shadow books, like after Kaluta left uh, DC's uh, magazine adaptation of The Shadow, uh, Robbins was perfect. But, uh, you know, once in a while, how do you turn yourself 180 degrees around unless you're, unless you got a waist like a robot? So there, some of this stuff was odd, but he's trying, he's trying to get to the Marvel thing, but it just never really gelled it's a whole different way of uh of working i mean when you use superhero bombast versus mood and uh just eeriness that eeriness that like a, a so-called um monster magazine would have and i got this because a ghost rider of course and uh i love this art here steve gann is the anchor on frank robbins he was another Filipino artist who came on the scene. He did a couple of, he did some magazine work. He did Skull the Slayer. And I don't know if he stood around or not. And he might have gone to D.C. because they were starting to uh, use a lot of the Filipino artists as well. So this guy's like, ah, I'm going to cure y'all. And, uh, well, I remember, that's my favorite panel where he's just like, I got to get out of here. And then Morbius shows up in Marvel 2 and 1. Excellent Arvel Jones and Dick Giordano. And Dick didn't do a lot of Marvel work because DC kept him real busy uh, in a variety of ways. Pencils and uh, inks. Uh, and we're kind of going into the post... Uh, the post-Morbius the post series where you have, uh, you know, Spider-Man. It was a John Buscema. And then we go to She-Hulk uh, with, uh, what is it? Um, I gotta see. Mike Vosberg and Danny Bolinati. Really ugly art. I'm sorry. And I don't mean that in a flattering way. I just mean, and Vosberg, when Vosberg isn't doing superheroes, he's really great. But I always had the feeling his heart was never into it because. It just you can just sort of read some stuff and think you know is this really good you know is this serviceable I don't know and then uh, you know I stopped reading She Hulk early on I bought it because Stan Lee and uh, John Buscema started out the series well somehow oh, that's a nice panel he did get a revival uh, in the let me see. Michael Malbius, I think he gets cured temporarily. So, but I just always find him to be annoying. So, but beautiful, beautiful cover. I think that's Earl Norum. Yep, he's an amazing artist. Well, that's pretty much it for uh, Morbius. I just wanted to show how <laughs> another display of crazy un unplanned unfocused fly by the seat of your pants uh comics creating was in the 70s it was just nuts and it was like okay we finished this one book this one's got a week to go or something you know you gotta jump over to here you gotta jump over there and uh so it's fun in a truly cheesy way it's kind of hard to take serious because it has a ton of superhero tropes and a ton of superhero cliches uh and not just uh yeah, the tropes of superhero -ish type stuff but the cliches that they use would could easily come out of the mouths of a superhero or supervillain so um yep 
that's it for now. And uh, I'm not completely bagging on more Morbius. I just wish, uh, well, in the 90s, they toned his costume down, and he was a much better character at that time. Uh, he, they took him real, just like they did Damien Hellstrom, Son of Satan, uh, into Hell of Storm. Well, anyway, that's it. And, uh, yeah, I managed to clip this short. And, uh, oh, 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 if you want to support me in the channel, uh, check out my novels. It's uh, take place in Pittsburgh. They're fiction. They're prose. Uh, the book's called The Demands. Three volumes are out. And uh, it's based on a Pittsburgh indie band of the same name. Uh, play at clubs and bars owned by the Russian mob. And our main character, Lainey, falls in love with uh, the nephew of the big kahuna uh and things get ugly, and it's available on Amazon, and I think you dig it. So um, that's it, and thank you for spending time with me on this episode. I know I sound, you know, really kind of silly, but, you know, you had 15, 16 minutes to spare, and you chose my channel, and I always appreciate that. So smash the like and subscribe button, and please turn on some more people. I want to, like, I, I'm taking no money from this, so I just... I, I just like to share my uh, insights. I will talk to you later. Bye.